Hi, everybody. Jason Klom here. A couple corrections before we get this episode of Phil Proctor started. Um, and uh, first of all, the Trepany fundraiser that he mentions is at the Steve Allen Theater here in Los Angeles uh, on Saturday, June 24th. I believe he says it's the 29th, but it's in 10 days, the 24th here. Uh, and he also mentioned that the SARP actor who played Nick Danger is David Stiefel, not Steele. Uh, so he just wanted to make sure I made those corrections. Uh, now the episode is, uh, you'll enjoy this. It's a, a good time with him and Firesign Archivist Taylor Jessen talking about the history of Firesign Theater uh, this is part four, talking about Don't Crush That Dwarf, Hand Me the Pliers. Enjoy. I'm Jason Klom, and this is the Comedy on Vinyl podcast. See, that, that's the thing. Uh, Let's start the the interview. Well, we started the interview. Uh, yeah, we should officially start it. Yeah. The year is 1970. <laughs> the album is Don't Crush That Dwarf. Hand me the pliers. The group, Firesign Theater. And my guest this week, Taylor Jessen. And once again, Phil Proctor. I prefer to think of it as 1969. When we of, did course. Album, of course. It was a sexier year than 1970. Naturally. Yeah. 70 was the beginning of the end. Let's sure. Face it. Sure. For everybody. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> scanning instrumentics. Scanning pictures. Pictures. I have thousands probably 10,000 pictures and negatives mm -hmm. in various boxes and and barrels and things in my garage mm -hmm. and it's, it was one of those things where I think 20 years ago I said it would be a good time now to go through these pictures and you know yeah and I said to somebody I said well what I'm planning to do is I'm going to save the ones I want and then I'll scan them and save them and I'll throw away the negatives he said why do you throw away the negatives? <laughs> I said, well, that's the point of it, isn't it? You know, you get rid of the pictures. Right. No, no. You ha I think you told me. You have to save the negatives. I probably he would be. He <laughs> would be the guy. No, did. Phil, God's sake, don't throw away the negatives. Of course. <laughs> I know. would have said the same thing. I was just, I was just thinking <laughs> about that the, the other day. The only reason is that, that in... Uh, there's there's uh, original objects, and no matter how far the technology goes forward, it, it seems you can always go back and cl and clean them up to some degree that wasn't possible ten years before. Even so dirty pictures. To dirty the <laughs> dirtier the better. Oh my god! But you see, I was raised with uh, with songs like by Johnny Mercer, like you got accent. The the, the, the well, I now can't remember the song. Accentuate Elim the positive. You got accent the positive. Eliminate the negative mm -hmm. and latch on to the affirmative. Don't mess with Mister in between. You took him a little, yeah. a little too thought, literally. Well, I, I guess I did, but you know, I was indoctrinated <laughs> at, an, at an early age. My mind was still soft and mushy Johnny told at me the to time. Throw away you know? the stuff. All the research that I had to do for the book was down in my office. Mm -hmm. And it had, you know, had to do with pulling out files and things and pictures and, oh my God, it went on for months and months and months. And now I can't find anything. Mm -hmm. I was going to bring another little book of, you know, what happened in 1969. Yeah. Now, I have a vague recollection that that's possibly, it was 67, was it, the last time that I had a... A, a book doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, which one do we do? 67? No, 60, 68. I think it was 60, 68. I want yeah, to say so 68. Yeah, so 69 is sitting there somewhere. Yeah. But I don't know where it is. Oh, no. I can't oh, no. find it. Damn so it. so it's it worse than a thumb drive, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, uh, going my way, uh, <laughs> going past me. So I, I couldn't bring any of that res lovely research material so I can look and go, Sure. Oh, yeah, I remember her. Mm -hmm. You know, and oh, I'm, I'm, I wonder where my child is now from, <laughs> from that alliance. It was it was a wonderful time, a very creative time. Fireside would ride out there. We had this beautiful, we were renting this house from Dr. Adolph, who was a famous radiologist. And it was, it was rock and roll. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was marvelous. Is fun. this the house where Phil Austin once spent an evening in an aqua lung at the bottom of the pool? I don't think so. We didn't have Damn. an Aqualung. No, we. Uh, Somebody told that story during a, during uh, uh, the XM shows. I don't even think Phil Austin. Why would he want to spend an evening in an Aqualung? Under? Too late to find out. <laughs> I, I That's would. True. Well, get out the Ouija board. Yeah. Maybe he'll. You know. Indeed. Wait, Doctor Adolf. There's an Adolf on this album. I feel like that ah, does it now. There is an Adolf. On this now album. I'm assuming that's just a joke. No, I believe. Was it a this, reference that this? was, although I can't be held accountable for it, mm -hmm. but I believe that I might have been living in this particular house at this particular time. Okay. You okay. know, I, I knew that I know that I wasn't married or anything, not until 71 mm -hmm. when I met Sheila. 
and I didn't do the the movie A Safe Place until seventy, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, it so, was right after Dwarf. You got on the yeah, right after Dwarf. Mm -hmm. So Dwarf was a really wonderful period, very creative period for us, and an opportunity to work and write together and perform together, because it was we had just finished uh, our second album. How can you be into a place at once? You're not aware at all. And Nick Danger, Third Eye, mm -hmm. uh, which means I was still with Kathy Cozy then. Hmm. Okay, that's getting murky. Because uh, <laughs> uh, she didn't live with me at at the the big mansion, so maybe I wasn't at the mansion then. Uh, I won't mention the mansion again. Okay. <laughs> uh, but in any event, we wherever it was that we wrote, yeah, uh, probably Bergman's house, maybe wherever he was. And uh, we would then perform the material at the Ashgrove, which is now okay. the Improv. Okay. In the tradition of the Marx Brothers, who used to perform up at the Libero Theater, try out their material. We really had the we we had established ourselves as a comic success because of Nick Danger mm -hmm. primarily, which so many more people could relate to. So that. what? Well, just just to talk about that because I'm. Taylor would be more familiar than I would be, but like, what about Nick? Dan like, what did Nick Danger do for you? Well, f first of all, uh, the story behind Nick Danger, which I don't think we ever talked about, actually. Okay, much. Dave Osman talks about it a little differently. His memory is a little different from mine. Who cares? Uh, <laughs> so well, we we both agree that you were in different rooms with different sound effects machines. Yeah, right. No, you can have he was in memories. the echo chamber, echo chamber, echo chamber. The, the the fact is that Nick Danger was was going was a pilot for a continuing series that we wanted to perform okay. as part of one of the ongoing Radio Free Eye shows. Okay, and I believe that we were at KPPC at that time. But I remember we wrote the pilot and we took it out to perform it on the radio for the first time, kick off this this series, to discover that we were locked out of the studio. I think it was a Sunday <laughs> night broadcast or something. They they had Was this Cam E. T? Could be. I don't know. <laughs> Some radio studio. You know, they're all the same. You know, they're either on the mm -hmm. they're on a penthouse or they're in the basement. And, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and in L.A. it's just a building somewhere. And you get to go in five times and then you're yeah, fired. Then you're fired. <laughs> uh, and they had changed management. It was now a Hasidic rock. Uh, no, Hasidic cowboy, uh -huh. I think, was what they were doing. <laughs> and uh, uh, so we, we couldn't do Nick Danger. And we couldn't kick off this wonderful... Uh, series so we said well what are we going to do with it and in those days as i think I, i've already pointed out the album had two sides mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it had two sides mm -hmm. see and uh <laughs> in fact i think on this one we call it side one and the other side yes that's how mm -hmm. this is described so we said well let's just put it on the other side okay <laughs> <laughs> of the of the how could you be mm -hmm. album it was fine yeah so we did and, and expanded it, of course, and we didn't perform Nick Danger. That was all a writing job, and then working in the studio. Okay. But uh, it it was a breakthrough because more people could relate to the the uh, the parody format. Okay. Sure. Which was a, a detective noir detective movies and radio mm -hmm. particularly, and so uh, it was a familiar format that people could relate to uh, on several levels and that's what turned a lot of people on to fire science they could follow this story okay that makes sense the characters are identify with the characters because uh, they were they were in many ways uh, stereotypes and it was really the goofiest thing you'd ever done to that point i mean the rest of the albums mm -hmm. have laughs on them but it's also really kind of turn your head laughs yeah sure sure yeah, yeah. it's it's true i mean uh, the the uh, college boy ruled I would say in the earlier albums, uh, Bergman and I, and and David, who was you know uh, New York intellectual background too, uh, more than Phil, who was from Fresno. <laughs> you know, uh, what are you gonna do? And and who had been trained in the psychological warfare division of the army. Did you know Holy that? Shit, yeah. no. When he was drafted, he was assigned to the psychological warfare division. That explains, that explains so much. a lot about Phil's sense of humor, and and uh, uh, and he also uh, had gone to Fresno High School or college or I don't know. Uh, Theosophical Institute with uh, <laughs> Richard Schulenberg, and Richard Schulenberg 
ended up through various manifestations of time uh, as the lawyer at Columbia Records. Mm. So we would go into to Richard Schulenberg's office, Phil Austin's college roommate, uh, or some kind of roommate, and he would explain. He'd go through all the contracts and in layman's terms. Austin would translate it into psychological warfare sure. terms, and then we would, <laughs> we would sign, you know, false names to the contracts and and make records. Yeah, so you know, so. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, to get back to 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 uh, the, that album, it was we were now established, and so we kind of, when we when we went into the writing, and we're making a little bit of money from doing this. Uh, we when we went into the writing of the album. We felt that we were kind of uh, liberated to to do this the the trilogy. This was the third part of our trilogy that we designed. Okay, first, three albums, and uh, and and I guess we took as inspiration uh, a day in the life by the Beatles. Mm -hmm. he, <coughs> that's when he blew his mind out of the car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Pardon me. And we we made it into a life in the day, and uh, and our premise was. Sitting uh, alone <clears throat> in, in your home or apartment watching television, mm -hmm. and uh, and and we invented the idea of channel surfing. Instead of having to get up and, and turn the knob, we invented this idea of just going click, 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 so that we could use the instantaneous change from one scene to another uh, as a theatrical convention, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which was very liberating to us because we'd all sat stoned in front of a television watching things and turning channels for such a long time. Sure. It was all part of our of our DNA. And again, something that we could share with everybody else because uh, television was becoming more obsessive in people's lives, especially at late, late at night. Yeah. And so we uh, decided to to write several skits and things that would fit into a format including commercials and talk shows and you know various things that you'd see on movies and things and uh, and we we put them on stage at the ash grove with appropriate costumes and masks and things that i bought at hollywood toy store and, and other people brought into the mix and uh tested it out in front of an audience yeah and that helped to refine the work uh, and the writing, mm -hmm. and also for us to to find what worked and what didn't, the rejection of things. I remember part of that, uh, we called it the TV set, uh -huh. okay, or a day in the life. Uh, pardon me, a life in the day. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we did was a cartoon show, where we all had you know silly animals. Oh my masks god! On. Okay, and <laughs> and I had a, I found a, an MR, thirteen some mm -hmm. horrible, Vietnamese war weapon mm -hmm. in plastic. With a, a loop of gunfire on it. Okay. It was the best dab. It's amazing. I still had it. <laughs> bang, 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 bang. And so what we did with, with the cartoon thing was uh, funny characters who made funny sounds. And then I came out as a funny character with a helmet on and killed them all <laughs> <laughs> with this gun. And ah! They all died horribly. It's a cartoon. Yeah, it love it. Mm. So, but that didn't make it to the record. But right. It was kind of visual, really. When you think about it, <laughs> there's a really good and uh, visceral too. There's a good capture of that in the the very last show for the Magic Mushroom, uh, yeah? which was Life in the Day. Oh, and really? That's that will be part of the upcoming, oh. upcoming, upcoming. <laughs> oh, that's out. Uh, MP3 release of the oh. full Magic Mushrooms, which oh is, boy, which are really ready to go. Wait, how really? did you differentiate between what's going on and what's on the television? Or was I mean, since it's predominantly what's happening on the television? Oh, but the the the, the show, the stage show that we did, mm -hmm. uh, I don't we had I don't think we'd evolved the George Tyler. Oh, okay, before. okay, I see what you're saying. All right, okay, okay. It was more or less just click, you know. Yeah, you did someone okay. on stage would have a clicker. Oh, that's yeah. great. From bit to bit, some of those bits were just. Click, click. Even two lines long, and mm -hmm. then you click right. to the next thing. Yeah. That's amazing. B -b 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 Fantastic cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Click, click. Yeah. Right. Great. Okay. Right. All uh, right. And and that really that that's so fireside theater. Mm -hmm. You know, and really nobody else ever did that. Mm -hmm. You know, not even Monty Python. Uh, uh, lots of people would do you know full fully formed skits and things. Sure. And and the Python would come as close to it, but you know, and now for something completely different. Yeah. You know, they 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 understood. 
that leap, the comic leap, and, and the effect that it could have. And they, but they could do it visually, which made it easier to understand. And so we 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 played with the the rhythms and the music of it more. But when we uh dis, when we evolved the piece into uh, a, a, a a phonographic format, we added the character of George the Retire Biter, uh, based on the the mascot of what UCLA or USC I can't remember UC, which, USC USC which was a stray dog oh, that's that right. became yeah. its mascot loved to chase cars so they called him George Tirebiter photographs uh, exist you can google this dog he's yeah you can google his hands are seen that, yeah and he, he was run over by a car eventually and Phil Austin called the album uh the five stages of man album uh -huh. because what he said was it it takes which is true it 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 basically is a story of an old guy who is reviewing his life in in uh, fugue states as he drifts between sleep and awareness, watching late night television in which they're playing old movies that he did when he was a star in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a fantasy in that regard that he is reliving, but he's also reliving his past from being a, a child actor to, you know, a, a character, act, leading man, let's say, and then a character actor. And so then before we get into the meat of the album, can you talk about the revival prologue? Where did that come from? Because I know Austin was oh, really, yeah, right. he was really, about... he was really obsessing about um, revival shows all through uh, Radio Hour, Hour in the summer. Of well, the whole, the whole Let's Eat yeah, kind of the, the pastor, pastor Flat. Yeah, it, it, basically, I think part of that inspiration came out of the fact that where I was living out in Encino, and I think I was living in Encino at the time, uh, on Ventura Boulevard, there was a church that had a spire that inspired me to think of a television antenna. It was it was very spindly and like and I thought oh this is God's message is coming through this television antenna mm -hmm. to this particular congregation, and that was the little I think that idea sparked the concept of we're we're going to give you a religious experience. I love it. You okay. know, electricity yeah. is giving you revelation. Mm -hmm. You know. The, from from the heavens, from the ether, if you will, mm -hmm. through the the antenna device down to your machine with his little rabbit ears on it, you are then getting all of this revelation, this information. What so are you going to do with it? It was a very deliberate uh, extension of the metaphor of the electricity that you've been riffing on. Uh, yeah, the, the electrician, wave for electrician, so like. But it also, of course, represented the power of evangelical television. You know. Uh, and and the idea of uh, making a mighty a mighty hot dog is our Lord. It's almost like you know you're feeding the congregation that which they're hungry. They're hungry for salvation. They're hungry, you know, to 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 uh, uh, feel a part of a group. They're hungry to be to, to find a way, a reason for living, and all of that. So you're feeding them with with this kind of spiritual food if you will a mighty hot dog is our lord it's something that nurtures your soul that you need you know to 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 live and and of course george lori tirebiter in his fugue state uh really reaches into the television and takes out his hot buttered gloat groat clusters or whatever <laughs> you know and is is really actually able to eat uh, because of course they don't serve up in the hills. We we always we always we posited a post-apocalyptic world of some sort or a totalitarian world, mm -hmm. you know, where basically uh, there are restrictions on what you can what you could do in that world, and they don't serve in certain sectors after an hour because it's maybe dangerous. Right. Well, right. is it still part of the fire sign world where it's post World War Two, but the, the ending wasn't the same ending as it was? Right. In real life? We surrendered. Right. <laughs> right. At the, at, right. At the in, in World War Two we surrendered mm -hmm. and therefore we're 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 living in this uh, um, concentration camp, if you will. If you concentrate hard enough you can get out of it, but 
Still. I notice on the album we do not get a definitive answer when they <laughs> shout out, "Who won Second World War? You so yeah, smart!" Yeah, right, exactly. No answer. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I know. Winners and losers. It's, it's, it's a, quite a metaphor. But anyway, we're, and we're in a concentration club <laughs> as, as, as Saturday Night Live put it, put it so well. But uh, anyway, so so th that that adventure uh, uh, really came out of uh, George's of our main characters. Uh, observations on the something which we were all commonly sharing. Now, uh, back to the physical album. Yeah. There's a, something, a little trick. I've. Uh, it's not a trick. There's something I have to describe about this side of the album. Yeah. And it says here before and, and after. And the before pictures are us in some of our masks. There's the George Papoon mask, mm -hmm. which I found. And then these are, that's, that's one of the masks from the cartoon mm -hmm. series, the, the duck, and then of course Uncle Sam, Uncle Sam and a uh, and a frog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just always has to be a frog. Could be a prince. I sure, why not? And then uh, uh, yes, the ice cream and baggage claim. It's amazing. Those. It's amazing. But the, uh, oh yeah, there it is. There's the there's the machine gun. There's the gun. Oh, that's the one. That's okay, it. sure. Nice. That's the gun. Yeah. With the loop in it, which mm -hmm. is probably on the album somewhere. The Phil, that effect. photo session is pretty crazy. That's like mid-69. Is that John Rose? Do you know? I don't, I don't know. know. I think it's the four of you. But there's somebody else yeah. in the room no, with I don't, you. No, I don't know. The mean, girlfriends took the are picture. there in the room. They're wearing masks, too. Yeah. And okay. there's, another, there's other shots that, the, oh, that some one of those shot are in the was poster. included. Yeah. Yeah, they're in the poster. And one shot was included in the book of the four of you plus two girlfriends standing on the stairs. And one of somebody has fake tits over real tits yeah that's right <laughs> there's a plunger yep. so that was this was all high. things i found at hollywood toy store all, all amazing these photos that are that you see in this era were uh some of them all came from one massive session of weirdness which was great well that was easy in those days mm -hmm. and then of course the second picture is is us performing uh together in the studio but it says after here and that's not what i originally wrote what I wrote was AFTRA, mm -hmm. because we joined the union, <laughs> the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. We joined the union when we made this album. So this was supposed to say before and after. But does it say before and after somewhere else? Because mm. I remember seeing that joke on some Farsight product, but now I don't see uh, it on this LP. They corrected it. Interesting. And then I didn't get possible. to proof it, and I didn't get to say, Damn no, it. it should be after. So, and, and it... it Anyway, but now you know. Uh, April and May, 1970. Well, it says we actually wrote and performed it in, in, in 1970. Huh. Who can remember? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, what's we great can. about listening to Radio Hour Hour from the summer of 70 is that you can hear all the little random real found objects, text objects, that later appear in Dwarf. Mm. Um, times two postal service workers... You know, oh, how many yeah. that's all from a creative playthings ad yeah. for like a bus, a multicultural bus. Yeah. Wow. A toy. And yeah, then the yeah, I had um, the figures. I had the little the little uh, uh, I still have some. I have the postman and the milkman <laughs> who are cut out of wood with uh -huh. paintings on them, you know. And and what was the other uh, bendable integrated workers or <laughs> you know, I mean please code your answer now. Oh my god. And the first time and, and Bill and, Trimmel. And it's them, you know, them. Name three. You can hear in the radio show where Bergman comes out with that line for the first time, and then there it is on the album. Yeah, and this was also as as you can see when you if you read the credits, a very collaborative album. Mm -hmm. All all the wives uh, and husbands were on good terms, and all talented. They could all sing and and uh, uh, and, and join into the chorus elements of this, uh, the Porgy Tire Biter song and all yeah. that. And uh, Bill Drimmel and the other engineer was uh, Jerry Hockman. Uh, Hockman in Chinook, I remember was his, his name. Uh, they were the, the uh, engineers at Columbia Square in the original studios that had been used for radio shows. Mm -hmm. So this was, I think, our last album uh, in, in under the auspices of these... Uh, non-union if you will of the, of, of the of the regular employed engineers at the studio mm -hmm. who of course had never heard anything like what we were doing right and were wonderfully inspired by it and helped us That's realize a lot of our audio uh, 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 
dreams. You know? Yeah. Where were those studio? Where Where are they where now? Are they? What What location is that? They're still there, but it's it's t- they're television news studios now. W- which one? Uh, it's in Hollywood on Gower. Oh, okay. Gower and Sunset. Oh, Sunset Gower. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Duh. The original Hollywood. I studios. forget that that's always Columbia. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's, that's right. Okay. CBS Columbia. Okay. Uh, and I remember during our our success in our venue. Uh, as guests, as artists there, they s- uh, eliminated the studios and subdivided them into A and R offices. Mm, okay. Because as Columbia became more successful as an outlet for musical groups and rock and roll and all of that, as the as the industry uh, of of LPs took off, uh, they they needed more and more uh, management, a sales force, publicity force, and it it just and the actual creative forces had to go elsewhere to do their studio work, mm-hmm. which you know was fine, but uh, it was a distinct, palpable tra- uh, transition mm-hmm. that we were all aware of. That's where we got to know Mike Oakes really well, Phil Oakes' brother, because mm-hmm. he was an a- one of our A and R guys, and uh, he went on later to become. Uh, well respected and well known as a supplier of music. I don't know what you'd call that for production music for movies. Oh, movies. okay, yeah, yeah. sure, sure, sure. He had an incredible collection. He may still have of of rock and roll and original records and forty fives and all that kind of stuff. You know. Did you do, were you working last time we talked about? Well, actually, this is the first time we're talking about how you're multi-tracking on multi-tracking on multi-tracking. Do you know how many original tracks you were working on with this? Out, like how many they had available? Was it still well, four? Well, they had more than the than the first and the second album. I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. I I've I've made this analogy before. When we started, you know, the tapes were about like that, mm-hmm. and then they got a little bigger. By the time we finished, the tapes Nuts. were huge. And I felt like we were shrinking. You know, and then they all went away because they digitized sure. everything, and and the studio became a little box you could carry anywhere yeah. to record with. But at this point, we probably had, I don't know, twenty, thirty tracks, maybe something mm. like that. Wow, not a hundred, sure, which was later, but but we we definitely had more tracks to work with. That's still considerable. Yeah, which which helped us as well to realize the soundscapes that we were uh, hearing in our heads, uh, but. What was wonderful fun about this album in particular was that we were comfortable enough in the studio by this point, uh, and we had a contract that allowed us, uh, that granted us free studio time that John great. McClure had uh, and engineered for us, one of the great executives uh, at Columbia who was in charge of spoken arts. Mm-hmm. He put us under a spoken arts contract, so we didn't have to pay for studio time in exchange for a slightly reduced royalty. Uh, and we were able to write, and go into the studio, lay stuff down, listen to it, go back, write some more, kind of stitch it together, uh, what worked, what didn't work. And so the album grew organically, which was a, a rare, again, a, a rare uh, opportunity that was granted us at that time. Yeah. And unique to us. Nobody else was doing what we were doing, and nobody else had the facility to do it the way we were doing it. So every, it was a learning curve. We were always learning every time we went into the studios. But you could imagine how exciting it was to be able to write stuff and go in and realize it, you know, and and immediately. Yeah. It wasn't like, you know, you had to, you have to write all your songs and then you go in and you do your album. Uh, you could write song by song by song by song by song, you know, and, and go in and lay them down, and it informed what the next piece was going to be like. Yeah, and, uh, and also, you had the the ability to do all the multi layering and to add voices and music. Yeah, and all of that to it whenever we 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 uh, were ready to mm-hmm. do that it was a tremendous freedom for us to be able to create a com- these complex stories on on an album and somebody else also pointed out this is the first time as i said that we we actually told a story from side one to side two yeah Mm -hmm. this is like one theme yeah one one unified theme which is another reason why this album became so popular because it was accessible because of the the metaphor of television and click 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 all that but it also told a coherent story a more coherent story 
from one from beginning to end and and through the life of uh, a day in the life of George Leroy Tirebiter, yeah. a major character. So it was really uh, enlightening for us. Rolling for Stone us. went batshit over it. They gave you they? two pages, and Rolling Stone was a oh. much wider, taller magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. And, and they eventually called it the greatest comedy album ever made in the, in the 80s, like yep. 83 or something like mm-hmm. that. And it's true. It really is one of the greatest comedy album is ever made because Absolutely. because it's so unique mm-hmm. and and still is yeah you know? i mean even among your other work even among the, the yeah, out of the is, body of your work signature piece yeah now it was followed by i think we're Obozo's on this bus mm-hmm. which is also a very intricate and prognosticative work mm-hmm. uh but I, and that was inspired in a great great part by the the success of this album and the fact that the album uh, again liberated us to be able to experiment more in the format mm-hmm. that we were working in, uh, but it's there's there's an obvious reason why this album is in the Library of Congress as an hysterical recording <laughs> or historical recording <laughs> because it really was uh, a cultural uh, uh, le- break, what, what do I say envelope breaker it established a new kind of a format for what you could expect in a phonograph in a recorded phonograph yeah. comedy format yeah you know? it set a really high bar nobody that no one had even ever tried no. to do before no and, and that's the other interesting thing about Firesign Theater in general we, we never we were never really in competition with other comic uh, other comic forces at the time sure because what we were doing was so totally unique and something that the four of us were in complete agreement about, uh, even though the process sometimes was painful because of you know individual egos and ideas. Of course, but, but we were totally united in uh, in our understanding that this was a something we wanted to do together and a, and a story we wanted to tell in a particular format together. And uh, everybody, all the other comedians at the time were basically isolated. A couple of duos around, I guess, but sure. Who else was in the bins at the time? Because there are just a few photos in your archive where you're, you're, you, somebody went in and took a snapshot, probably Phil, because yeah. Phil couldn't stop taking snapshots of of a bin, and you're right next to W. C. Fields. Yeah, well, but that was it's, it. Was just I it remember would have just been Bill Cosby, wouldn't it? I think most of the of the, uh, of the comic geniuses of the time. I'm looking at Phyllis Diller over here. Mm-hmm. The some, there'd be some Phyllis. There'd uh, be Jonathan. Winters. Were, were you know single singular people with singular voices uh and and great comic minds i think let me think when did we perform with steve martin when was that that was he was starting to to do his stuff at that time 69 really yes yeah there were i think that the that the early 70s were probably a ripe time for individual comedians to do their stuff sure Uh, when did uh the first family come out when was that 63 Nope. Wait. The first one would have been sixty-two, I think, and the second one was sixty-three. Am I wrong? Wait. Hold on. Because that was a concept. Right. They, album. they might actually mm-hmm. both have been sixty-three. My apologies. I literally have twenty copies of it sitting there. I <laughs> okay. should know. I'm not joking. There are twenty copies of it there. You you should, be, well, you know, one of you, you, you should you didn't know. Need to tell everybody in the Jason, world of your shame, Jason. You right should there. know uh, more than anybody uh-huh. something about the chronology of these comedians oh i believe albums. me oh i absolutely should so where do we, well, where do we fit into the panoply feel free to of, start anytime <laughs> the, this the, is recorded in october 62 but if i'm not mistaken it was released early 63 the other one was recorded early was recorded shortly after this came out and then released late 63 spring of 63 and then had a few months before okay. and, uh, they could no longer and sell. And New Heart was was happening. New Heart was then? 1960. His first one was 1960. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. There were already a wonderfully established individual sure. comedians doing phonograph records of, of their routines. Yeah, and some of them were conceptual. At least, at least, First Family was conceptual. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Stan Freeberg was conceptual. Of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so I mean, we were. It's not as though we were working in isolation. We were inspired. By these these other great comics, mm-hmm. and uh, and yet, I think what we added, what what Firesign added, was the element of silliness and surrealism, mm-hmm. uh, the English approach to comedy, the very verbal and intellectual approach to comedy, and yeah. the, and the uh, 
a psychedelic aspect of it as well. Uh, so those elements transmogrified what what comedy was becoming into our own particular little branch or you know stream off the main river. Yeah. And uh, and and when Python burst on the scene, we felt that the, these were our comic brothers. Of course. Again, inspired by the Goon shows in yep. England, and mm -hmm. the, which were highly surrealistic and mm -hmm. you totally unique and still hold up magnificently well mm -hmm. as as absurd comedy. You know. Mm -hmm. And remember, there was also that that uh, movement of, of absurdist theater that was happening at the time. Uh, uh, Ubu Hua and uh, Cocteau, well, not Cocteau. Sam so Shepard and John Guare. Well, in, Amer in America, yes, Sam Shepard and John Guare. And overseas, who, maybe Stoppard. And, jo and Stoppard. So Bergman had worked with Stoppard mm -hmm. in uh, Stoppard, whose, whose Stop, real name is Stop Polish. At, at the Berlin. Whose real name is what? He was Polish. Stoppard is Polish. I can't remember. His, you could look up his real name. But he, uh, uh, he and Peter were at the Berlin Colloquium together writing together and then Peter went on to write with Peter Sellers on a television show uh, in England and for me I went to Yale with John Guare and many years later in the 60s around 67 or so I was uh, uh, cast in the, the ensemble of mm -hmm. a play called Musica mm -hmm. which was being done as a Monday night at the Tapers Mark Taper Forum uh, in Los Angeles and Phil Austin and his wife were in this ensemble in their repertory company. Mm -hmm. And I was then chosen to do the lead in Musica, J Jack Argue, which is an anagram of, oh, yes. okay. of yep. uh, John Guare. Mm -hmm. And we did it as a main stage production where I got to work with uh, Barry Chase and with, uh, oh, uh, oh, seven of the wonderful actors. I don't think of her name in a minute. And Phil Austin, mm -hmm. the who is in the, the 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 ensemble, and at the end there's a scene where I, uh, I've been drafted, and I'm Phil Austin and I are on, in bunk beds getting ready to go out in, a, uh, in Vietnam, getting ready to go out on a, uh, uh, what I, I wasn't in the army so I don't know on a something. Sure, we'll say and, bivouac. That sounds right. We'll say bivouac. Sortie. Yeah, sortie. Yes, there we are. And, uh, <laughs> and we're putting on makeup, camouflage makeup, except we're putting on clown makeup. <laughs> and uh, and then I kill myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think blood dripped down on Austin in the lower bunk. I can't remember exactly what it was. But working with Phil Austin on the stage, you know, with yeah. fellow actor. It was wonderful. And, th and that was uh, Sherry North. Sherry North and Barry Chase played uh, this wonderful, funny prostitute part. In this thing, Chinese basket job, you likey, and uh, it's an amazing play. anybody it is who an anybody play. who can has got a couple minutes to go on Alibris or something and look up a book uh, published with Musica and Cop Out and a third play that I can't remember. By John Guare. Yeah, you can probably get it for ten. House of Blue Leaves. Amazing. But before that, he also wrote Six Degrees of Separation, Six degrees of separation. <laughs> which is yeah. a, I mean, John. John is a. I actually I'm going to be heading back to New York after this trip to Europe that we're taking. And I'm going to see if I can get in touch with him. I'll be reconnecting with Austin Pendleton, mm -hmm. which is how Peter and I first met. And uh, we're just talking about him last night. Yep. Yeah. And Bob Grossman, who did the art. Exciting. That is exciting for this. Love that cover. I mean, that that cover is equally as memorable <sighs> the as the album. Yeah, totally. Bob Grossman inv it created the popularity of airbrush art mm -hmm. like this. And he was Peter Bergman's roommate in mm -hmm. Yale. So he's to blame, but he's also to thank. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> And Austin Pendleton, when I was in the Dramat, with the likes of Sam Waterston and John Badham and Peter Hunt, Richard Malpe Jr. and Finkel and Whedon, and uh, Tom Ligon and Skip Hennett and Billy Hennett and all these wonderful people. And then in the drama school, Joan Van Ark and Dan Trevanti and wonderful actors and, and John Guare and blah, blah, blah. Uh, when I was doing that, Austin wrote two musicals, one called uh, Tom Jones mm -hmm. and one called Booth is Back in Town. And in Tom Jones, I played the lead role and Bergman co-authored the lyrics. And that's where I first worked with him. Mm -hmm. He was class of 61 at Yale, I'm class of 62. And in uh, uh, the next piece, Booth is Back in Town, which is the story of the uh, uh, Junius Brutus Booth, who was a famous actor of his time, and his two children, John Wilkes Booth 
and Edwin Booth, mm -hmm. who com were competing as his sons for leading man, uh, and I played Edwin. Peter wrote all the lyrics for that, uh -huh. which were parodies of uh, late uh, 19th century songs, you know, theater songs mm -hmm. and things like that. If anyone has not heard the soundtrack, Fuji Puzzle Box, the whole the whole album is up. You, oh, is you, that up you, there? You got to listen to it. That oh, yeah. is taylorjessen.blogspot.com. Some, some damn catchy tunes, Seeing the Elephant. There's a lot seeing of Seeing the up. Elephant, Seeing the Elephant. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, that particular experience of working with those great people was was something that really set me uh, on the path of, of being an actor because mm -hmm. prior to that time at Yale I was a Russian language major and I'd gotten to the Soviet Union with the Yale Russian Chorus in my freshman year mm -hmm. uh, so I really had a developed a conversational fluency and an opportunity to sing all these great Russian folk songs and things. wait are there any albums of that I want to know what the yeah. first album you're on do you know the first album of all that you're on period yeah I think it was probably the Yale Russian Chorus Taylor, have yeah. you heard this? Taylor, have you in found the, it? In the... We don't have it in the archive. Now i got to find it. What the hell, Taylor? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. What I need to hear this. I'm pretty sure. Uh, uh, That's amazing. Have you got it, maybe? Downstairs? Gosh, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think so. If somebody's out there who has it, <laughs> just contact us, please. Indeed. Ooh, Hello? Oh, I think we uh -oh. lose... Well, we lost video, but we didn't lose audio, so okay. what's going to happen is we'll have a lot of fun little photos that'll go along with it. Taylor didn't even know there was video happening. Yeah, there's... I, I knew there was video happening. I and just... now Taylor just found a Star Trek tricorder. Now we have to describe visually Shows everything over. that happens. So, well, uh, <laughs> but we still... I'm completely... Stop. Yeah. Yeah. Audio. It's so, okay. <laughs> uh, all right, so... Uh, bourbon, uh, Yale, uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Well, let's, do you have some favorite bits that you wrote or anybody wrote? Do you have favorite bits off this album, period? No. No. I can Nothing. never remember, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, sure, Ralph's ball sport and stuff like that from mm -hmm. other albums. I mean, there are certain pieces that I did. You mm -hmm. know, Pastor Flash is on this, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I wrote Pastor Flash. Mm -hmm. But, but, so, so often, uh, I had a, a deli lunch with, uh, Andy Thomas and my co-author of the book uh, Where's My Fortune Cookie, Brad Schreiber, and uh, Richard Schulenberg mm -hmm. to discuss for certain legal aspects uh, involving Firesign Theater and, and uh, me as an author and all that. And he pointed out to me something about the four or five crazy guys. Because the, when you talk about material that we wrote, my assumption was always that the fifth crazy guy was really the owner, the, the author of most of our material. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because the four of us would collaborate together sure. and we'd all bring stuff in. Mm -hmm. But more often than not, in these days, in these early days, the authorship would become, would become sublimated mm -hmm. by the, uh, uh, all of the contributions of each individual writer yeah. mm -hmm. and performer. Because once we got it up on its feet in the studios, there would be an element of improvisation that yeah. would enter into it. And so whoever was speaking the lines or altering the lines or, or uh, uh, designing them to fit into the particular context of the piece we were doing uh, had a little more ownership than the people who might have written it originally. Sure. But the ultimate result to me was the fifth crazy guy. Then Richard Schulenberg says to me, oh, no, I'm... The fifth crazy guy. <laughs> oh, we're going down a whole Yoko road there. Uh, the, the road, Anybody could say that. No, no. The road that he was going down was that when when we came up with the name of our publishing companies, mm -hmm. one of them was the four or five crazy guys. Uh -huh. And that's because Schulenberg was actually a partner mm -hmm. in mm. that. Interesting. Okay. Why I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> okay, I see that. That's right. But now. but you know, so the, he has he he's he was a lawyer, and I guess he took a little legalistic slice or something. I don't know. But creatively, I still believe yeah. that the reason we came up with that name mm -hmm. was because we realized that at a certain point we had to relegate ownership. We had to uh, let go of of personal ownership and just embrace the body of the work itself. Yeah, you know. But I have performed things independently uh, from various albums mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and and yet and some of them were definitely my own mm -hmm. but the others you know like David and I have now David Osman and I are the only surviving members of the Fireside Theater at, at this point and uh, recently I performed 
uh, with my wife, Melinda Peterson, by the way, who's in the other room, avoiding hearing all this over and over again. <laughs> uh, we performed at the uh, Radio Enthusiasts of Puget Sound, the Reps OTR convention. Uh-huh. Mm. The Radio Enthusiasts of Puget Sound old-time old radio time convention. Radio. Sure. And we had a wonderful weekend a couple of weeks ago up, up there in Bellevue. Mm-hmm. Not the hospital, but the, the, <laughs> the town, although it was pretty crazy. And David came up and participated in uh, Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House, which Melinda mm-hmm. and I starred in. And he played the painter, the one, you know, she says, not a, not a, not a, a hospital white, but, you know, an eggshell white. And he go, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, the scene, I don't know if you know the movie. It's Cary Grant and Myrna Loy. Okay. And it's one of the funniest scenes where she goes from room to room describing what color she wants and being so precise. And at one point she says, now here's a piece of thread. This is the red that I want. And he says, now don't lose it because I had left it. And he goes, uh-huh. And he says, you know, and it's, a, it's not a crimson red. It's not a candy apple red. It's like, you know, a, a cardinal red. And he goes, no, no, no. And it's not. A, it's not a candy apple red. No, no. It's it's a, it's a, a cardinal red. Uh huh. And so at the end of the scene, he says to his assistant, "Did you get that?" And the assistant says, "Yeah, red, white, yellow, green, blue." <laughs> it's a wonderful scene, and David was killer in it. So uh, we also performed some fireside material. Awesome. Uh, for them, as spe- because they were they they wanted us uh, to honor us, and. Uh, and 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 the next time that we might perform together, mm-hmm. uh, the next time I'm appearing is uh, at the Steve Allen Theater mm-hmm. before they tear it down and turn it into condominiums. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, on the tw- the 29th of June okay. after I get back from the European trip, as a fundraiser for uh, uh, Trepani mm-hmm. Trepani Trepani Production Company, uh, to, for Amit to raise some money for them. Because they're going to have to find a new venue to do their, right. their crazy stuff in. Yeah. And we're going to show some movies there, too. Do Ooh, you know? yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So Taylor will be there to show some movies. It'll be a, primarily a QA. and a And it's just me. We can't get David down to do it. But in September, uh, apparently a, a, a performance is being put together in Washington, D.C., Really? Uh, maybe Washington ACDC. I'm not sure. Exactly Who knows? Where we'll figure be. it out. Yeah. Uh, Can't tell the difference uh, anymore. With David and me, because we are, we have. We are in process, we hope, of selling our archives, mm-hmm. which Taylor has so beautifully preserved for us, uh, to the Library of Congress. Yeah. And there, there seems to be forward momentum in Good. that regard. Good. So it'll either be a celebration yeah. of that mm-hmm. announcement, mm-hmm. or we'll grease the skids to further you know, uh, uh, hope that we can actually fulfill that that desire and get them to, to buy our archives wonderful uh so and that'll be a performance of a piece that i i just read in a, a book that david's going to be coming out with on a, a bear manor press called the fighting clowns of hollywood which are his reminiscences of the creation of that particular show wonderful and and a compilation of scripts that we were working on during that particular period of our history together. Mm-hmm. And one of the ones that we performed was the Arley History of Radio Show. <laughs> yes. An mm-hmm. Arley convention in Virginia for NPR. Uh huh. And it was a piece we performed just that one time. And it was the three of us, David and Peter and me, mm-hmm. because Phil, who doesn't didn't like to fly, although he's flying now, uh, <laughs> Uh, wasn't able to join us there, so we had him in by satellite. But it's a three-man piece. Uh And I said, David, you know, we can combine that. We can make that a two-man piece pretty easily, right, by switching a few roles. And and it's very funny. It is the the best... the bit where it's the, the history st- suddenly starts turning. Yes, the Hindenburg. The and nothing the Hindenburg. happens. Nothing happens. <laughs> and nothing back happens. to you. Right. <laughs> one, of the, one, of, one of the best yeah, radio it, jokes. But ever. it does. It starts from Marconi era. Oh, and Marconi. here comes the Lindbergh baby. <laughs> right. right, right, right. Uh, anyway, it's a very funny piece. So I think we're going to adapt that into our performance. That's wonderful. At that particular time. Uh, uh, book-wise, there's a whole lot of stuff going down. David has, I think... The Flying Saucer, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Saucer, it's called, mm-hmm. uh, which will be a 
uh, a script that he and uh, Phil Austin wrote for The Grateful Dead. Somebody from The Grateful Dead. The right? saucer thing, they w that was on Joe Dante's shelf for a little while. Yeah? But he didn't pluck it. Mm. Well, I, I have not read Austin's Grateful Dead screenplay, though. I oh, that's right. It. That's I what I'm thinking of. I saw it for a second. That's really what I'm know. thinking of. It yeah. should be page, interesting. You know? Yeah. Well, anyway, Saucer is going to be published also at Bear Manor Media Press. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And with with David's notes about the writing of it and all that, mm -hmm. and uh, and he's got another book. I, th I th oh, gosh, what is the other one? It's another Ronald Reagan murder mystery. I believe. <laughs> yes, volume two. Volume two. The uh, uh, the flying saucer. Uh, the, yeah, it's also has a flying saucer mystery. motif to it, doesn't it? Yes. It's got Lenny Bruce. In yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I've uh, besides my biography, kind of, <laughs> my surrealistic psychic biography, uh, where's my fortune cookie? I've written two Proctor and Bergman books, uh, or f fulfilled the, the books that Peter and I are working on. One mm -hmm. is The Scripts of Power, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is a surrealistic soap opera we did about power in Hollywood uh, back in the 90s, produced on uh, John Hockenberry's Heat program by uh, Ted Bonnet, mm -hmm. who later became Peter's writing and producing partner in a business that they had of doing radio uh, trailers for movies mm -hmm. for many years at Fred Jones Studios. And uh, it, they're funny as hell. It's pretty good stuff. And they yep. really do tra translate well into reading, uh, but there's also available, you know, a, a CD oh. of, of, of Power mm -hmm. as it was originally broadcast Excellent. in like five, five minute segments. It's a wonderful That's piece. Good. And, and uh, the other one I wrote is because uh, uh, Ben Omar, who is the head of Bear Manor Publishing, Bear Manor Media, uh, wanted to, to know if we had an original script of uh, Americathon. Yeah. And I, I found two transcriptions of two performances. And so I have, I painfully transcribed them. Oh believe my. me. <laughs> mm -hmm. One of them was a video, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Painfully that, that, that was done by... Uh, What's his Gilmore. Name? Steve Gilmore. Steve Gilmore. Who did an RTV or not TV movie for us and Martian Space Party mm -hmm. and the Fire Sign. Uh, a good collaborator. Just as crazy as we were <laughs> at the time. And uh, anyway, I got Neil Israel, who directed the film and collaborated with Peter and me to do it, uh, to write a wonderful foreword. And then uh, I put in the Ur material, the original material that was later transmogrified in, into the film. Mm -hmm. But the story of that film of Americathon, which is a cult classic. Mm -hmm. I mean, people still can go to it. There's a lot of great predictive stuff in it, and, it's, and it, it has its moments. But basically, Neil and Peter... Okay, Neil Israel had caught a performance of our show, Americathon. For those of you who don't know what that's about... We did a thing called Gothamathon, where we go into a city as Procter and Bergman, and and and, and say that we had to raise money to save the city, <laughs> and so that's what we're dedicating our show to tonight. And we'd become become various performers. Jerry Jerry, who was Peter, was you know he'd been up for twenty four <laughs> hours and he was trying to gamely carry on, and and I was I don't know Gary Gary a performer. <laughs> but we had and then we had all these crazy uh, Procter and Bergman pieces that would come in, so. <clears throat> He caught a, a, and then we changed it to Americathon mm -hmm. to, to come up with enough money to save America from bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And Neil caught one of our performances, I think, in Boston, and came back. I had done a film with him called Tunnel Vision, mm -hmm. right, which is his claim to fame, uh, that also had Chevy Chase in it and Howard Hesseman and mm -hmm. gosh, so many wonderful people uh, of the time. And it's also it's a it's a cult classic, uh, TV, TV uh, pardon me, uh, Tunnel Vision. I played the, the uh, Christian Broder, the the owner of this cable television station mm -hmm. that was, you know, being uh, censored by the U.S. government mm -hmm. because it was it had obscenity and all, I mean, nudity and all. The, it was a real precursor of what was to come. Uh, so anyway, Neil sees it and says, "I I want to make a movie with you guys out of this." It turns out that I was at the time living with Sheila Wells off on off of Phyllis. She wasn't helping us with that. <laughs> but off of Phyllis, down Doheny from Sunset. And his offices, where we wrote the movie, yeah. were on Doheny, just up from Phyllis, <laughs> right? So we're writing the movie there. And it was a good experience until Peter and, and, and Neil 
started clashing. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, two Jewish writers. You mm-hmm. know, <laughs> I was the Buddhist writer, <laughs> but uh, the Amish writer. <laughs> but two Jewish writers. They started clashing over things, and st- they were both stubborn about ideas. And he basically wanted to fire. He fired Peter, and he asked me to stay on the project. And I made a tactical error. I I freely admit. I should have said to Peter, you know, Peter, if we're going to maintain our voice in this project, I'm going to have to stay with it. Mm-hmm. I'll consult with you, but our our voice will still be there. Mm-hmm. I didn't understand. My loyalty to Peter was what I felt mm-hmm. more than anything mm-hmm. else. And Proctor and Bergman, and I said, Neil, I can't do it. I really, you know, Peter's my partner, and I can't. And and that was a mistake because then I, he hired Pat Proft. Mm-hmm. Like, well. I'm PP too, you know. And they went on to have great success in all kinds of of areas with funny movies and things. But it, it was a tactical error. I've I've I made many of them in my career, and yet I've had a nice career. Still having a nice career. It's fine. Sure. It's okay. Another path opens. But the movie then went in divergent ways mm-hmm. from the more surrealistic concept that that we had had created, and so it's not a great movie. Mm-hmm. But it's not a bad movie sure. either. And uh, and there's a lot of great people in it, you know, Harvey Corman, and uh, uh, oh God, I, I don't even begin to dare. It's all in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's all in the book. I just exposed somebody to it last night by giving them my second copy of the soundtrack. So oh, okay. he might discover the movie through the soundtrack. Oh yeah, and John Ritter, of course. That's yeah, right. He's sure. The no, no, it's, it's, it's a that. fascinating. If you Google it, it's a fascinating cast. And if you see it. You know, there are some, some very interesting things and some good high points. But it's not a Procter & Bergman movie. Right, right, right. It's based on an idea from Procter & Right. <laughs> okay. We should, uh, I want to make sure we talk a little, you know, you said you specifically don't have some favorite bits from this album, but I do. Now, okay. I, I've had to listen to it, you know, so the first time I heard it was actually when Jeremy Guskin, the delightful Jeremy Guskin, who couldn't mm-hmm. be here today, uh, that was the first, this is the first uh, Firesign album we did, ever did it on this podcast. Ah, okay. And he's like, this is the one my dad exposed me to. He said, you have to listen to this. Basically, lay on the floor with headphones on and listen to it. Uh, recently talked about it with a gentleman named Tommy Edison, who is a blind gentleman, blind Tom from Edison. birth. Oh. Yes, yeah. And he loves this Young album Tom because Edison. I'm blind from birth, and this is just so immersive for him. Uh, I'm obviously, you know, I'm obviously a latecomer to it, but there's so, and I usually the dumb jokes are what are going to stand out to yeah, me because right. I'm I'm an idiot. I mean, I went to college, but I'm still, no, I'm, you know, You're an educated idiot. I'm an educated idiot. Um, and I want to ask you, Taylor, first of all, where you heard this first? When did you first hear this album? Do you know? I first heard this album on QE K U O I F M in Moscow because it was either my third or my That's fourth. Moscow, year. Idaho. It yeah, not Russian. <laughs> <laughs> Proctor and Bergman came Russia. up in '75, and, and then Proctor, and then 20 years later, I talked to per, uh, Proctor on the fr- for the first time on the phone, and he said, "Oh, you're you, you're you're in uh, a station in Moscow. Let me do a let me do a, an ID for you. Now, here's Perry Stroika. He's going to do the ID. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. Perry, Perry. Wait, it's Moscow, <laughs> Idaho, not Moscow, Russia. Uh, oh, um, I forgot. <laughs> When Proctor Bergman came out, Proctor said, hey, we have a little announcement here for the Moscow area. There, I hope that's clear, and everybody up here in Moscow will hop to to They had a wonderful saying, I didn't know you spoke Russian. My God, they, uh, it's very good. He said, oh, no, no. No, your pronunciation was wonderful. That's exactly the same way you did. That's the only way I know. That's the only way you can do it. It's an amazing station, free wow. format, and they had a big comedy library in the back and there were two or three inches worth of fire sign ah, on the shelf awesome. and this was the period where i was buying my own comedy lps see size does matter folks mm-hmm. it's true mm-hmm. yeah the more inches on your shelf well fire right. signs up to five feet now <laughs> uh, the, the, so much so much fire sign real estate up there i was playing python albums i was playing steve martin albums mm-hmm. very, very carefully mm-hmm. editing out the fucks on the air Oof. Mm-hmm. and then here comes fire sign i wondered who how who what's what's going on with this mm-hmm. and i was yeah. hooked straight from uh, electrician because of uh, let me hear it for me you're under arrest yeah, right. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, uh, it's like the door slammed yes I'm 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 in this room forever mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and then I went through in chronologically and that was the first time I heard dwarf and I played it without previewing it oh. and didn't get any calls except from one Vietnam vet who said it reminded him of when he was in uh, Nam stoned off his ass oh. really yeah really that's amazing 
So that was the first time I heard it. Wow. The I, fucks, are, the fucks are pretty quiet on this album. So I know that sure. it's dedicated to the F dash CC. Yeah. But That's true. The they're pretty great CC. though. You could you could pl- you could play this on the air and, and get away with it, I Fuck think. Fuck you. Oh, it, no. it, it was it was it was well, that's another reason for our success was that uh, about the time that we we were starting t- to reach national recognition uh fm radio uh, reared its ugly head yeah and uh and the, and and the whole stereo world opened up sure and college stations were from the first to really discover it and to exploit it okay Makes and they sense. could play our stuff because it wasn't nationally broadcast right right but remember the whole impetus for our career was based on the fact that you'd listen to this in the privacy of your own home sure Mm -hmm. yeah you know that was how we got around the whole little did we suspect or expect rather that a long form comedy uh, LP like this would actually become played in its entirety on on broadcast (laughs) media you know Uh, so that was a big surprise for us. Now, one of the reasons why Proctor and Bergman broke off from Fireside Theater was that uh, we had two things that we wanted to achieve. One, we wanted to tour more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and since Phil uh, uh, was uncomfortable flying and liked to travel with his wife and his dogs and his van, mm-hmm. that severely restricted our opportunity, our ability to hop around from place to place and take advantage of uh, of the audiences that were out there for us. Mm-hmm. And also Phil and Dave wanted to do another album. We were not adverse to doing another album, but we felt if we just stay as a recording group, you know, and then go up sporadically, go out for tours that we can design around Phil's availability or ability to get to the venue by the time we were performing, yeah. it, you know, it's going to be more of the same old, same old, and we're not going to expand our base. So we, uh, uh, we, we, we knew we had to create our own material and our first album was TV or Not TV which was when I think of it first done as an album before we created a show based on it mm-hmm. and we the, the, the concept behind it was kind of a hybrid in that yes it was going to be a story with you know re- reoccurring characters or established characters Fred Flam and Clark Cable and yes it was going to predict the idea of a hundred channels Mm -hmm. was it 500 now Mm -hmm. you know and cable cable television and all that stuff and yes it was also going to predict piracy you know which has not happened to the same degree happened more uh, less on television more on radio Mm -hmm. you know pirate stations and Mm -hmm. things like that and kids getting hold of, Mm -hmm. of cameras and 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 you know, taping infantile programs and things like that. Well, mm-hmm. that's come true. Mm-hmm. Except that they're just infantile adults, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, but out of that, we we designed a show that was bits. Yeah. And and drop-ins. We said, you know, if we want to expand the base of Fire Sign from our celebrity, if we can offer them short bits that can be played on the radio, mm-hmm. like traditional comic drop-ins mm-hmm. will have a, a, a better opportunity to reach a wider audience and that's still happening yeah when i get um, uh, royalties now from uh, a service called sound exchange mm-hmm. invariably it'll be 90 percent proctor and bergman played on xm radio or, okay. or S- sirius or what have you and then 10 percent fire sign <laughs> because wow. it's hard to excerpt Fire sign, sure it you is. know, yeah. and yet you have to look for the specific excerpt collections, and it's it's exactly. really just shoes for industry. That's really. right. There's only a, I a, put together that drop-in CD a few years ago, yeah. which is like 75 minutes of all drop-in yeah. stuff. And I wish we could release that commercially, but it's got one. The, a lot of it is Sony, and a little bit of is it Mercury. Oh, so it's one just going to have to be one of those promo-only things. Yeah, I know. I damn I, it. But this, this was, in a way, it's uh, uh, it's a, it's a mistake that we made in not in not saying. You know, uh, let's put out this kind of an album with Sony mm-hmm. or with Mercury mm-hmm. drop in, so that you can, you know, we can expand our playability on the air. Uh, and we didn't do that, uh, but we did put out that wonderful forty-five forward into the past, mm-hmm. which is funny little radio excerpts. Mm-hmm. You know? uh, but again, it's, it's there. There are areas where had we. My supposition was: Have we been able to uh, sustain management 
we might have been able to do more things like this. Sure. But because of the, the personalities of the four men, it was pretty much impossible to agree on uh, a management company that satisfied everybody's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, vision mm -hmm. of what it is we, we should be doing together. That makes sense. You know? That makes sense. Yeah, but we worked with some great people like uh, James William Guercio, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, uh, Larry Fitzgerald with him. And, and we had opportunities to work with some highfalutin managers along the way, but it just... It, 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 pretty much an unmanageable group of, of crazy hippies <laughs> when you get down to it. I yeah. uh, I do think I don't know. I've had I've had. To First of all, I was I don't know why I found a mention of laughing cow cheese so funny. I don't know why that was so funny to me. But what are we gonna do, Lieutenant? What are we gonna do, Lieutenant? What are we we gonna do, what Lieutenant? Are gonna do, is though? I don't know why that's so fucking funny to me. But that is one of those things where like I want to see how it's written. These are those are the kind of jokes where I'm like, how the fuck did they put that on paper? It's because zen, that one is Zen perfection. It really it, is. Yeah. It, that and then what is reality? When somebody yells mm. out from the crowd, what is reality? That is yeah. That's I'm that, glad. That's, I mean, that's all yeah. a fire sign in one line. Really, I mean, that is yeah. fucking. That probably should be on my tombstone. Right? <laughs> For years, I thought it'd be too hip for the room. But, <laughs> but what is reality is as good as any other epitaph. I'll I go can, with I whichever direction of. you yeah. decide to favor. And, boy, what is reality is, is... It's a great line. I ask myself that every morning. Of course. Of course you know. Well, what's extraordinary about this album is mm -hmm. that there's certain lines on here that are better historical summaries than whole books i mean mm -hmm. if you want to understand the indian genocide in america you oh. only need you only need one line uh -huh. here's the lovely trail of tears golf course yeah yeah, yeah. this it's whole true. this whole album is packed with little things like that that just detonate yeah the, it's it's true you. there there was always a uh, uh an ability of the group to synthesize cultural ideas and social ideas mm -hmm. for maximum effect because what we were trying to do was to be both subliminal and subversive at the same time sure uh, and and that was politically a conscious decision that we made to be subversive and subtle so that stuff could zip by and certain minds would hear them mm -hmm. and certain other minds would not hear them sure and that's why you know we we uh, acquired such a an incredibly intelligent and uh, dedicated following yeah uh, what, during the course of our experience in releasing records in those days who else in your league would you would say was operating in such a subversive bag because i can only think of subversively maybe, yeah maybe credibility gap yes yeah i that's would say the, the credibility gap yeah. and and remember we worked in alliance with them a strange mm -hmm. association with them because a richard Beebe, uh, who was a, a newsman helped to create the, the credibility gap and there's somebody else there's another name Earth News, uh, who did Lou Irwin? Lou Irwin, yeah, right. Uh, visionaries, really, uh, who who were trying to 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 do a hybrid transition between hard news and surreal and comedy, surrealist yeah, yeah. comedy, uh, and they succeeded really in the credibility gap. Uh, and Harry Shearer is maintaining the tradition mm -hmm. with remarkable consistency through all these years, uh, but. Not they. They were performing at KRLA uh, when we were performing, and we would do the Radio Free Eye show, and then they would come on. I think before the news or after the news, and do a little surrealistic okay. comedy yeah. news thing. Yeah. Right? And when we were performing at the Ashgrove, that was another venue where they would work out. Interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah, and I'd go down and watch them work. You know. And... Did you ever meet the guys in uh, Conception Corporation? Yeah, I think I did. Uh, and there was another group, too. Uh, uh, the other Proctor, Proctor and Ward. Oh, yeah. Up, up in Santa Austin Barbara. Austin and Austin worked with them yep. a little bit. Yeah, Proctor That's and some Ward. That's funny stuff. And, and the elephant, what was the one with the elephant name? Uh, uh, well, let's see. The Dudley Do-Right players in uh, Milwaukee, you know, mm. something like that. You know, again, this, this is an area that would be fun for you to investigate yeah. what other groups were uh, extant at the time that we were that it were inspired by Fireside Theater yeah. and 
went to i've been trying to pick that apart well i mean that's the only one i could think of first was credibility gap especially Mm -hmm. because harry shearer when he did this podcast mentioned that time when he got what it it was what was the article where they said oh right was it they Uh, the way that you do not make the credibility gap happy is write a big article about them and then say they're the fire sign theater yeah yeah Mm. yep yep (laughs) i don't remember which were they talking about he told me he told me about like the date of the uh, of the article and i immediately went to the fire sign archive to see if we had a copy you don't have it damn it it. i also in this context i also have to mention albert brooks sure oh yeah 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 because he (laughs) i he's a genius in my in my mind sure uh and out of my mind too, <laughs> and he created some very interesting conceptual albums as well, mm-hmm. uh, and has a unique voice. Still has a unique voice, <clears throat> and I love what he did in the movies. I just loved. I loved it. it uh, of course, his name is Einstein. Mm-hmm. Albert mm-hmm. Einstein. So, mm-hmm. a good series, by the way, if you want to watch a good series on National Geographic's the the genius it's called mm-hmm. the story of Albert Einstein. We're enjoying it very much. Uh, and you don't have to be a genius to watch it because <laughs> it's his, you know, his romantic escapades and his growing up and everything. It's very interesting. I will say contemporary to Albert Brooks. So, like, I'm starting more to appreciate Lily Tomlin's albums because. Oh, Lily yeah, Tomlin, that's really another, strong. Another genius. Because, I mean, to make an album wherein the entire premise is she's being interviewed about the making of her album. Mm. Fuck you. That's mm. too good. Yeah. That is that is just. And then, like, to mix it in with live performance and that, which is so hard to do. Well, when actually, she, it's good that she... you brought up. It's good that you brought up Lily because 70 is the mm. year that Dwarf and This Is A Recording This Is A Recording out? also came out? This, okay. is a reco- ah. this Is A Recording won the Grammy. You know, I have to reacquaint myself with that. because It's I a good album. It's funny, but it is. it's also, um, it's kind of, I mean, it's skitty. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of it, I, I hate to be the bearer of uh, the news of a laugh track, but there's, right. there's ah. extra laughter that they added to this <clears> live <throat> performance she did at the Ice House. But Modern Scream has got, I mean, I don't know if that's her best. Is it what, what's I've heard? You've probably heard more of them than I have, Taylor. But well, there's there's just the four that I know of. But Modern Scream is amazing. Yeah. And then there's and that's the truth, which is based on her. Uh, and that's the her, truth. Her, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I can't remember what the kid's name is. Uh, what damn Ellen, it, Ellen? Fuck uh, God. Uh, God, she was on Sesame God, Street too. I think. Me too. Or Electric Company or something. Any other time, I could have yeah. literally told you the name. And then yep. there's there's on stage, which is excellent. Edith Ann. Mm-hmm. Edith, Edith Ann. Thank Edith you. Ann. Jesus. See, I got the E right. So. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. It was a start. So, I mean, no, I was. I mean, I was just trying to research sketch comedy. Well, for, again, yeah, and yeah, and you I was know, trying to find other ones. Again, I mean, of all the of these people, we we were in our own bubble, mm-hmm. uh, driven driven to you know uh, to continue to develop a particular kind of surrealistic comedy. There's no doubt about it, and and yet we were as influenced as everybody else by these other great comedians sure. uh, who were, were turning out stuff at the time and to, and also expressed various degrees of surrealism surrealistic understanding uh, there was one un- unfortunate thing I met uh, I met Lily uh, not too long ago they did a, uh, a version of her one woman show uh, about the visit the aliens oh, signs of uh, Signs, signs of, of life intelli- in the whoops, intelligent me. life in the universe. signs of intelligent life in the universe okay yep uh, they uh, down at the lgbt center in hollywood mm-hmm. they did a multicast mm. version of it that mm-hmm. was very effective yeah okay and and she was there with with her with the author mm-hmm. the night that we were there and so i got to say hello to, to jane and mm-hmm. to her and uh she had come to see she was going to do a television show and she did with remember Barry, uh, Doctor Demento was part of it. Oh yeah, kind of a light fantasy little variety. Interesting. Show. Okay. And she wanted to work with Fireside Theater, and she came to see us at the Roxy, and we were doing I don't know maybe the Owl and Octopus show or mm. Men in Hats or one so of our more obscure late seventies. Sure. Yeah, late seventies. Scripts of which, by the way, will be available in David Osman's Fighting Clowns of Hollywood. Awesome. That's, gonna, that's gonna be a good book. Really, wonderful. The scripts that he has been able to assemble. God yeah. bless him. Uh, 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 are just wonderful. I was roaring as I read through this stuff and going like, "This is funny." You That's know, exciting. who wrote this shit? You know? <laughs> and 
And, and to think that we memorized it and performed it. it? And he writes agonizingly in his diaries mm. about how exhausting it was to do this. I bet. You know, and, and how, you know, all of us had different attitudes about it. I was surly, you know, and combative. And Austin was depressed. And Bergman was trying to find something else to do. And, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's really funny to read one one member's you know, observations of these things from from his psyche, yeah. what was going on, because we all have different observations, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, but but ultimately, uh, that uh, she came to see this Roxy show, and we had we did a piece in there. It was Austin and Austin and Bergman, I think, where two women playing uh, tennis, mm -hmm. and we were making jokes about menstru menstruation, uh -huh. and that turned. That around. was it. Wow. That was it. That was the end of it. Yeah. So you go like, oh gosh, you know, wow, okay, well, and she's right. I mean, maybe we shouldn't have right. done jokes about menstruation, but women menstruate, and there, are, some of it is, there's comedy there, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. But if Sarah Silverman does it, you know, it's acceptable. <laughs> if Phil yeah, Austin different, does different it, school, yeah. it's questionable. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right. Right. So, uh, but and there's another thing too, which is uh, the difference between performance and audio, audio performance. You can get away with a lot more stuff in audio performance than you can when you're performing live on the stage. Sure. Mm -hmm. And you can do more live on the stage than you can get away with in, in audio. Yeah. So there's there's a, a balance. And I think that that's one of the things that was interesting about Firesign uh, experience over time, which was that we were uh, attracted to performance. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're also experimenting with ways like Lily Tomlin did in her album, to uh, meld live performance with studio. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's the word I even want there? Uh, it's st well, studio performance is one way to put it, but uh, there are things you can... Augmentation, there's mm -hmm. a word I'm okay. looking for. Yeah. With, with the kinds of augmentations that you can create taking live material mm -hmm. and studifying it. You know? Yeah, yeah. Like in, in, in our Eight Shoes... In Fighting Clowns, the album, mm -hmm. with that extraordinary artwork by the late Phil Hartman, mm -hmm. uh, we we took a live show, my God, where we had a band on stage mm -hmm. at the Roxy and and, sa and sang, the four of us sang, you know, punk rock and, and, and jazz music and rock and roll. I mean, my God. And ballads mm -hmm. and things. Incredible. Uh, and then took it into the studio and jazzed it up and added little skits and things around it and all that, yeah. you know, with more control. Fred Jones, bless his heart. And it's beautifully blended together. Yeah. And you don't know where it comes from. It We do it as a live performance, and there's a live audience, not augmented. Uh, but it goes other places. Yeah. It goes other places that you can't always do uh, on stage. Sure. I mean, as long as it's done for the, the art of the piece and not just like we're talking about just like here's some extra laughs we didn't get like that's the hard part where it's just like let's let's if you if you're oomphing everything else for the effect of the home listener i mean what the hell well she that? probably didn't even have any control oh i'm sure she didn't oh no oh, i'm first, sure she that was her first album well that's so, why you yeah. get to modern scream and it's like oh she got to, she got to do some shit <coughs> like and that's mm -hmm. it's it's a solid now, the album. one time that that uh we worked with a laugh track was when we worked with milton burl on uh the National Lampoon radio show. Oh my God! And uh, we did a, a piece called Joke Squad. Uh huh. I'm not sure who even wrote it. Maybe David Shepard, but uh, Phil and Peter and I. David was. Pardon me. I keep hitting this microphone. <laughs> it's okay. David was uh, uh, in Washington, I think, doing his NPR show at the time. Uh, so, and, and Milton Berle. So it's Milton Berle and, and, and Pete and, and Phil and I in, uh, I think, in Fred Jones Studios in Hollywood Boulevard in Sunset, pardon me, in Hollywood on sun, off of Sunset. And Milton brought his uh, laugh machine guy mm -hmm. with him. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and he had, this laugh machine guy had this little box with the little levers on it and things and knobs and all. And he would be in another part of the studio probably the other side with the engineer uh -huh. and Milton would say because the, the premise of this piece was we arrest we're the joke squad we arrest Milton Berle for stealing material mm -hmm. but it turns out he's stealing it from himself mm -hmm. you know? so, mm -hmm. and, and uh, so 
we we have to he has to do a routine mm -hmm. uh, uh, to to kick off this this skit so he does one of his routines and he would say uh, after a run through, he'd say, so uh, Earl, whatever the guy's name was, he said, I want a, a titter, I want a titter after the, the judge joke, and then uh, the woman, put the woman in and I'll come make a comment. Okay, <laughs> so he'd say something like, uh, my uncle, he was a psychic, he knew the day he was gonna, dr gonna die, a judge told him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There'd be a laugh, mm -hmm. and then a woman would go, like, <laughs> oh, you liked that one, did you? <laughs> oh, like, well, listen to this. <laughs> You see, and, and he could design. Oh my God! He could design. The, it was wonderful. It was sure. flawless. It's almost an art on its own. <laughs> it, it, of course, it was a great crazy. art. You know, that's crazy. And uh, and perfectly in keeping with the uh, uh, the mystique of stand up comedy. Yeah, yeah. You know? Did he know who you guys were? Did he oh have yeah, any? yeah. That's oh, yeah. awesome. And he told us his, you know, the standard stories of mm -hmm. how long his schlong is. Of course. The, the, my, the favorite story was he said. We had a contest, uh, you know, with, uh, let's see, um, oh, a couple of people who were known for long schlongs. And in the contest, you'd go into like a sauna and you'd just be wearing a, a robe uh -huh. and you have a manager. Your managers would be in there with you. And you'd, and then at each one, one in turn, you'd take it out and show it and see which had the biggest schlong. And his manager says to Milton, he says, just take out enough to win the contest. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. God damn it. <laughs> Which apparently he could, you know. I, oh. I, uh, I, I have, this is a total side note, and I apologize. We already got sidetracked anyway. I do have a friend who now owns Milton Berle's Powder Puff, like his famous Powder oh, Puff from no, the TV really? show. Oh, no, Yes. Makeup! Well, won it at, yep, won it at an auction, and I saw it. It's just like this giant, it's an amazing thing to own that kind of shit. Yeah, you I know? remember the little guy with his hat on backwards or something he used to come run in and, <laughs> and hit, hit him, him with, it. with it you know I mean, listen I grew up watching this stuff on, on sure. television I grew up listening to the radio yeah. I was so lucky I, I, having been born in 1940 right perfect transition up, period I grew up listening to the radio and I, I remember uh, a story I've also told several times the end of the war mm -hmm. end of the second world war <laughs> right before we surrendered <laughs> uh, I was in Goshen, Indiana and uh, with my, my family my mother, my dad, and other relatives. And uh, all of a sudden, the radio, which was playing music, was interrupted by an announcement of some sort. And then they played music again, and everybody was cheering and dancing, and they got out the drinks, and they were drinking yeah. and hooting and hollering. They said, what happened? What happened? The war in Europe is over. What? I was like five, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vaguely, Where's but my I remember fucking little orphan Annie? to this That's day the energy mm -hmm. of that. You know, mm -hmm. of course I would. You know, That's amazing. It, it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, and then listening to the radio in New York, I had a radio, as many of us did, right next to my bed. So at night I could listen to the radio, especially the horror story, you know, the suspense and the detective things and all that. And in the morning, I'd wake up, you know, to Jack Armstrong or, or, or Hi-Ho Silver right there next to it. And I kept, I remember I imagined that inside this little glowing radio by my bed were these little studios. Love with it. With all these people. It's so funny. <laughs> you know, because I kind of, my, I, I knew the bat, I knew the reality of radio because mm -hmm. my dad uh, would take us to radio shows. We saw Arthur so Godfrey good. from the sponsor's booth and I saw a live, uh, wasn't a Henry Aldridge might have been a Jack Armstrong. Anyway, it was a sitcom on the radio. So <clears throat> and I remember the first scene was taking place in the rain. It was at Radio City Music Hall in New York. And the actress came out with umbrellas. <laughs> so and that great. was, I kind of went like, aha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which is why I try to, when I do audio uh, performances, mm -hmm. I try to the best of my ability with minimal props and costumes sure where it's not going to be distracting but will augment the performance of course i'll add an element of that to That's make things so clear good. and i had a wonderful uh opportunity recently i was uh asked by the, the sag after radio players sarp to uh direct a fire sign theater piece uh for volunteers from sag after actors and actresses mm -hmm. who wanted who are, who are part of this workshop program to learn how to do live audio theater awesome okay and bill cates mm -hmm. and uh david uh oh what's david's last name 
anyway, but Bill Cates was the Bill has worked with mm-hmm. with uh, um, with uh-huh, uh, <laughs> with Taylor over there. Bob <laughs> Telford, Bob Telford has has been uh, it's been like his baby to really to put this program together, and so Bill Cates and I put together an evening with the Fireside Theater or something like it, mm-hmm. which was a compilation of pieces mm-hmm. stitched together in a certain way. Ending with bozos and the destruction of the of the fair future fair, and uh, and I cast two uh, three minority girls, mm-hmm. uh, a, a Latina girl, Valentina, wonderful, um, a Asian American mm-hmm. girl, Patricia, and uh, a black girl uh, whose uh, name is. Carla with a K. Mm-hmm. That's your professional name, mm-hmm. Carla with a K. Love it. And then uh, Jamie Alcroft, my partner in Boomers on a Bench, to essay the David Osman roles, Catherine mm-hmm. Wood and all, because he's, he's a perfect mimic, too, as well as, you know, bring his own thing to it. Uh, David Steele, uh, who was the Nick Danger character, an older actor with gravitas. Yeah. And a good sense of humor. And uh, Bill Cates, who played the doctor and beat the reaper and and the president as mm-hmm. well and nailed it uh, uh bob telford uh, bob is bob telford excuse me bob telford who also played announcers and other parts and who else was in it with me oh and townsend coleman mm-hmm. really love it oh what a talent! That you is know? a guy I've been wanting to get on this show for a long oh, time. Oh, really? Yes, yes. Oh well, I can help you to get him on the show. I well, mean, that's why I mentioned. He's, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's in the Ninja Turtles. So as a little kid, like I grow up with. Yeah, him, you and, know, and I mean, he was on. he was the tick. He's the tick, and, of course. And, and he yeah. got the fire. He helped to get the fire sign theater on the tick. Mm-hmm. We that's did so two great. of them, and then I did so one. Great. I have an so action great. figure of one of the characters I played on the tick, mm-hmm. the chair, oh, right? <laughs> the evil villain, the. chair. Chair. chair so there's an action figure of me as the chair what do i do <laughs> nothing just, you can sit on me you know <clears throat> but townsend brilliant he just and he has saved I, I i gave him peter bergman's hat his bradshaw his bradshaw hat. wonderful and he said he was so he just was so touched by that and he I put bet. it on his head and could do that. Mm. Oh, that's great so anyway it, a great cast wonderful people and what I did was I added the elements of the costumes and the bozo noses and, you know, and, and uh, various things to, to differentiate the characters. Oh, yes, and then we had another wonderful actor named Keith who looks like Barney. Uh-huh. I mean, he's, he's a rotund, broad-faced uh, uh, Irish guy with red hair and everything, ruddy complexion, and a wonderful actor, mm-hmm. wonderful character actor. And he just brought such vivacity to the, to the part, of all the parts that he did. Uh, and, and it was a thrilling uh, uh, experience for me to be able to work with other actors and to tell them reveal to them what's funny about what they're saying mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not always clear sure you know? sure and where it came from and where it's going and and what the character sounds like and and sometimes it was just like no the, your signs your freeway signs mm-hmm. so what do you do you just talk you're a sign yeah you're a sign they're all trying to act it they said no no you're a sign <laughs> just say it yeah. just say it and it's about the rhythm the rhythm the rhythm the rhythm the rhythm and then yeah. the outbreak of the rhythm and the rhythm and and so directing it was a joy. That's amazing. Plus, I also played a uh, Clem mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you know various other uh, roles during the uh, Nancy. No, no, Nancy was played by Patricia, uh, a beautiful, beautiful Asian girl, very well played. Anyway, it was great, great fun to bring Firesign alive mm-hmm. uh, with other actors, and it worked like dynamite. But what it also did was. It showed the people who have been working in the SARP program what they can do beyond just presenting old-time radio of course, scripts yeah, yeah. and how they can make them more exciting mm-hmm. through the use of microphone choreography, mm-hmm. costumes, you know, uh, broader characterizations. Yeah. And, and I, I really was grateful because they got it. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I'll probably direct some more straight material yeah. at some point because I want to continue to bring these kinds of understandings 
to stand up live audio theater. Yeah, that's amazing. I would love to see some. It was of a that. great opportunity, uh, and, and of course, it was mainly open to after SAG people. Mm -hmm. But uh, you could bring guests in as well. Mm -hmm. And I do have a recording of it, which oh, I will, I will oh, share cool. with you. I'll share with you yes, both. Please. Love to hear it. Uh, as long as you know it's non-broadcast, of course, fine. of course. Because Bill Cates, who is a terrific producer, uh, very bright and, and, and wonderful collaborator, he took the recording, uh, the raw recordings of the performance. And he augmented them, and he edited them so that they're tight, mm -hmm. know, where there was a little drop cue or something, because it's a live performance. Sure. Or there's a cue where somebody's moving and something is happening. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he just did a wonderful job. That's awesome. Of putting this in together. Cool. So what I should do is I'll, I'll make an MP3 of it, if, if that's the way I can do it, and send it. That'd be great. Cool. Yes. But... Okay, so how are we doing? Right? Uh, well, I, we're fine. I want to, you know, what I'll do is I'm going to leave this up to Taylor this time. I want you to tell the audience why they should listen to the, uh, this album. Let's say they haven't heard Fire Sign, don't, don't know anything about it. Dwarf, why fire? listen to Dwarf first? Um, if you've never listened to Fire Sign, absolutely start with this album because it's uh, it's the centerpiece of the reason why they're important. Um, you'll you'll laugh a lot obviously but mostly your your brain will turn about 35 degrees yep it will have that effect on you just because it's not just a comedy album it's a really uh tight driven uh piece of of drama that mm -hmm. really gets a bow tied on it at the end everything is brought everything that's mm -hmm. set up is delivered um yep. it's a really strong uh, a con it's 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 a strong single piece, and yeah. it is you know a thing you know what, what you did, what you reminded me of when you talk about like the the uh, resolution of the piece, the arc of the piece. Uh, it the, the final message is really one of resistance, because the story of of George Roy Tirebiter, uh, the actor, is that he rebelled against one of the roles he was asked to play mm -hmm. in Parallel Hell. Mm -hmm. which is a war movie he was cast in as a uh, lieutenant uh, somebody or other he, he w uh, is asked to has a line which is we're going to go out and kill and he can't say it yeah. he won't say it kill the gooks he won't say it yeah. he can't say it and he is brought up he's he is fired and he is brought up for breach of contract and there's a you know there's a whole jury scene a whole mm -hmm. about it and he basically uh, 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 lost his career because of his own moral choice. Yeah, and yet, and there he's sitting watching all of this and remembering all of this, mm -hmm. what the choices that he made and what happened to him and everything. And the album ends with him reverting to his childhood again, because uh, uh, an ice cream truck in the in the morning mm -hmm. yes, when he right. finally wakes up uh, out of this fevered dream, uh, mix of reality and memory and. Uh, and uh, reminiscence uh, an ice cream truck has come up into his sector and he hasn't eaten all night mm -hmm. he couldn't get any or, or any beef halves we deliver because they don't deliver up there so he goes running out on the street after it and his voice gets younger and younger and younger yeah. hey mister wait for me and oh. it's a really sweet mm -hmm. ending so it's a whole cycle of you know birth and rebirth and yeah it's, it's lovely and it's it, and it's you can listen to it in that way over and over again, if you choose to, because it works. It, it works yeah, cyclically. I think God, it's fun. Since since we did it in 1970, it's still pertinent. Yeah. You know, what what other you know comedy albums do you, can you find pertinent? You find them more like their museum pieces, right? You know, red at the top. I mean, that's just the thing. I mean, I've been listening red to a comedy top. album a year, a day for the year. So um, I'm a little behind, but I mean, I'm I'm past 100 right now, and most mm -hmm. of them, even if they're quote unquote good. They're not re-listenable. I mean, I found I had a friend come over yesterday, so I could give him a bunch of my old comedy albums because why bother? I mean, the only fire signs he got were, were my duplicates, you know? Like, uh -huh. they're, they're these other ones where just, I don't, some great comics were just, this was fun. It works for that time. Yeah. I have no yeah. need for it anymore. Well, fire sign is going to keep you emotionally involved yeah. over the years. You yeah. will have a reason to go by back to it because there will be 
a, a resonance in it that isn't funny that is just simply a part of uh, your life that it's revealing. is real mm -hmm. it's revealing and it does it, it's relevant a lot of the stuff that we did is relevant to human existence i think so yeah and to trying to make your way in society and in life now and what, the bits that are funny are, are the ones that are going to continue to be because they be are funny. subversive yeah. yeah and they st and they stay subversive and it remains useful in your daily life to to just just look at your goddamn motherfucking tv and say <laughs> just shout what is reality at it and that's well, never not gonna work yeah it's yeah. true uh, but we, we we again we were conscious of the fact that we wanted to to uh, do a uh, spectrum mm -hmm. a spectrum maybe a, a spectrum <laughs> of comedy spectrum. <laughs> from from the lowest pun the groaner yep. up to the highest arcane um, uh, re re reference mm -hmm. that you know only one person in a, in a hundred might get and yeah. laugh at yeah you know. And, and, and the result of that was that many people would say to us, I didn't think anybody thought the way I did until right. I heard your album. Right. And it made me feel much more confident about how I was observing life and living life. Yeah. Because I felt like I had, you know, I, I was not isolated. There are other people in the world who think like me. Yeah. And there are couples who got married because of that, you know, throwing out fireside theater lines at a party or something, <laughs> you know. So, and that still happens, which is fascinating. Uh, uh, I mean, I have to wrap this up yep. because I have to go back and deal with the horror of not being online. <laughs> of no online, yeah, <clears throat> sure. But <clears throat> before we take our trip next Thursday to London, London, and then to uh, Vienna to celebrate on May 24th our 25th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, we're going to see the Lippes and the Horses, mm -hmm. and we're going to see a Mozart concert, and we're going to see Wonderful. Beethoven's Fidelio mm -hmm. at the Opern House, right across from the hotel we are staying at. <laughs> uh, and then we're going to, oh, with with some Canadian friends of ours on a motor trip through Switzerland. Wow. And I'm going to get to visit Bern, <clears throat> Bear, where my uh, Amish ancestors come from. Really? Um, the Yoters. I'm a Yoder. Uh -huh. cool. And so that, and I've never been there. I want a trip to Switzerland on the dating game with Deborah Wallace. Yes, Wally, you mentioned that, right? yeah. And I had to turn it down because of some fire sign commitment. You Ooh, might you, you might have gotten Do killed. Do you want to hear the sound of you one might hand have gotten clapping? Killed with Chuck Barris. Yeah, right? I just hit myself in the forehead. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. And, and then after that, we're going, I'm flying back to New York and we're taking a, a limo up to Yale where I'll be emceeing uh, uh, talent night at my 55th Yale reunion. Really? That's mm -hmm. awesome. And after that, back to New York, where I hope to connect up with Austin and Pendleton and, and Bob Grossman and so many other wonderful friends who are, are there, uh, I will be speaking as a guest speaker at the graduation of my elementary school, Alan Stevenson School on East 78th Street, where I went to school from 1948 to 1955. Wow, that's amazing. And I'll be speaking to that is this is the hardest speech I, I've ever written <laughs> because how, I'm, but I'm going to start it with good morning fellow kids. <laughs> as you should, as right? you should. Because my basic message is don't grow up, please. <laughs> please. Yeah. If, if there's any any message I can give you, stay open in your mind and yeah. your body and your spirit, you know, and play, play as much as you possibly can yeah. with life because it's all you got. This is it. It's, it's hard yours. enough growing yeah. growing old. Yeah, you know, yeah. why why yeah. why bother? So <laughs> I also would say real quick, this album, I don't think we'd have the Simpsons without this album. I think we're pretty confident that that's the case. We know Matt Groening's a big fan and this mm. this has that kind of Exactly what we're talking about. The high, the low brow, but all all to coming together for one cohesive point. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't. It's also a very pretty cover. Don't yeah, yeah, it it's is. Very it's pretty Bob cover. Grossman really Damn iconic. Is what it is. Now, now, the next time we get together will be, uh, I think we're all bozos on this bus. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, is uh, very predictive about the whole computer revolution. And, Hell yeah. And, I'm excited uh, about that. Yeah. The, the, uh, I can remember that one pretty well for some reason. <laughs> oh, I guess I think because we performed it so many times. Okay, you know we 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 did not perform it well because I'm talking. About yeah, it. save we'll, it. We'll we'll save it for the we'll, next we'll episode. Save it for the next time. I don't want to burn it. If we burn no. it, then you know people get angry at me. No. They won't get angry. But anyway, uh, well, you'll uh, want to hear it. It's exactly. So I will make sure then that this comes out before 
what did we say, June 29th? Because, yeah. Because, okay, so we'll do that. And then that, because we've already talked about what you're doing. Yeah, because so. it's a fundraiser and people That's are amazing. welcome to come and, and see the show at, at the Steve Allen Theater. That's great. Uh, out there at the end of the I, end of Hollywood. I need to go see that. I need. To yeah, go you see should that. be there. I'll, I'll, I'll be go. There. That'll be fun. Um, well, thank you uh, very much for being here, Phil. As always, nice to be here. Taylor. Glad I'm still here. Me too. Thank you for having me. Of course, Taylor. Here, here. You're always helpful. Where, where? There, yeah. there. Ta- Taylor does a lot of work. Taylor does a lot of Taylor work. Taylor's an him. angel. Let us... He's our angel. He's the best. Um, and thank you guys for listening. And as always, have a good thing. <laughs>